energy and air pollution will be one of the top five issues for the general election. We talk about Putin being in control. He's not really. It's the various factions under him and it suits them to have him at the front. You're trying to save for a house deposit and you'd have to save up some crazy amount of money. How on earth are you going to do that if a pint is seven pounds? There are certain key things that we want from India and there are certain key things that they want from us. Hello, you're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Lizzie Burden. Now, this could be an unusual Prime Minister's questions. We are back from the recess, back from party conference season, but Starmer and Sunak are likely to be quite unified on the issue of the Israel-Gaza war. President Joe Biden is in Israel. He has suggested that Israel was not responsible for the deadly blast at the Gaza City Hospital that took place on Tuesday a deadly blast that killed hundreds. But it will be very interesting to see what actually emerges from this Prime Minister's questions. Yeah, the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly on X, formerly known as Twitter, posted that too many people have, quote, jumped to conclusions about who's behind that deadly attack on the hospital in Gaza. He said getting this wrong could put even more lives at risk. Wait for the facts, report them clearly and accurately. Cool heads must prevail. But we have had, by partisanship on this issue so far really mm-hmm. from David Lammy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, uh, backing up James Cleverly. It'd be interesting as these events unfold uh, to see whether that wavers at all. Yeah, well, I mean cool heads, uh, a number of countries have already blamed Israel uh, for the events including Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. So perhaps that was uh, the, the pointer that the Foreign Secretary was talking about. Look, I note also that the Director General of MI5, i.e. the domestic um, focused uh, agency, that's Ken McCullum, warning of a higher terror threat for the UK as a result of this conflict. So, you know, there are repercussions across Europe and here in the UK. He was speaking to US media saying that the possibility that profound events in the Middle East will either generate uh, more volume of UK threat or change uh, its shape in terms of what is being targeted. Uh, you know, that that is what um, the MI5 boss is looking at. Yeah, Mark Regev, who is a former Israeli diplomat and civil servant uh, spoke to us yesterday. He was on Sky later in the day. He said that he expects Rishi Sunak to visit Israel. I should say is it, it, Rishi Sunak has taken to uh, the podium. Mm. What do you call the podium? Uh, the dispatch the box. The dispatch box. That's it. I've been Americanized. I've been at Bloomberg a while. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so look, um, you know, well, on that point of Rishi Sunak going to Israel, it could be as soon as Thursday. So we've had uh, the German Chancellor Scholz, Ursula von der Leyen of the EU, as I mentioned, Joe Biden, um, going to Israel. But also Emmanuel Macron is meant to um, be going too. So this is a sort of a whole flurry, a, whole, a huge effort of diplomacy um, by global leaders by Western uh, leaders, as well as a sort of show of support for Israel. I wonder, look, what other MPs are going to say in this Prime Minister's questions. We were talking to so many and to Cabinet Ministers during that party conference season. We saw them up close. I wonder what they're going to talk about. Um, if indeed this is the topic that does dominate today's PMQs. I'm sure it will be. It's a sombre mood in the House of Commons. You've got Sajid Javid, the former Conservative Chancellor, speaking at the moment. But just on those condemnations of the attack from European leaders, Emmanuel Macron, the French president saying nothing can justify striking a hospital, nothing can justify targeting civilians and likewise Ursula von der Leyen saying I'm saddened by the strike and the huge death toll there is no excuse for hitting a hospital full of medical staff and civilians I'm sure that's the tone that will be repeated in the House of Commons. Yes I also note uh, the Iranian call from the Foreign Minister via an official government telegram channel for an oil embargo against Israel you know, this is just one of the notes that underlines um, how the tensions are ratcheting up and how really what is happening in Gaza is being viewed so differently on both sides. Here is Keir Starmer at the dispatch box. Welcoming the new member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the news last night of hundreds killed at the Baptist Hospital in Gaza is incredibly distressing, but it's much worse for the people of Gaza. Their fear that there's no place of safety is profound. 
international law must be upheld, and that means hospitals and civilian lives must be protected. Last night, the Foreign Secretary said the UK will work with our allies to find out what has happened. I know this only happened last night, but can the Prime Minister please tell us when he thinks he might be able to update the House on progress with that work? Well, I, uh, I know the whole House will have been shocked by the scenes at uh, Al Ali Hospital. Any loss of innocent life is a dreadful tragedy. And everyone will be thinking both of those who have lost their lives and the families that they leave behind. We should not rush to judgment before we have all the facts on this awful situation. Every member will know that the words we say here have an impact beyond this house. Yeah. This morning, I met with the National Security Advisor, but also the chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee. I can tell the honourable gentleman our intelligence services have been rapidly analysing the evidence to independently establish the facts. Uh, we are not in a position at this point to say more than that, but I can tell him we are working at pace, but also cooperating and collaborating with our allies on this issue as we look to get to the bottom of the situation, and we will also continue all our efforts to get humanitarian aid into the region. Your stump. I thank the Prime Minister for his answer. The terrible news last night came as we are still mourning the terrorist attack on Israel last week. Jews taken hostage, mutilated, slaughtered. <laughs> And yesterday, I met the families of some of the British hostages held by Hamas. Every minute of every hour of every day, they hope for good news, but fear the worst. They know the lives of their loved ones are in the hands of murderers. It's unimaginable agony. Israel has a right, a duty, to defend itself from Hamas, keep its people safe, and bring hostages home. But isn't it clear that if Hamas had a single concern for human life, a single concern for the safety of the Palestinian people, then they would never have taken these hostages and they should release them immediately? Yeah. Yeah, well, Mr Speaker, it is important consistently for us to remember that Israel has suffered a shockingly brutal terrorist attack and it is Hamas and Hamas alone that is responsible for this conflict. Uh, our thoughts are rightly with those who have been taken hostage and their families. The distress they are feeling will be unimaginable uh, for all those affected. Uh, I will be meeting with some of the families and offering them all the support of the British government to get their relatives home. We are working around the clock with our partners and allies to secure their freedom. And importantly, in amongst my other regional calls, I spoke specifically with the Emir of Qatar yesterday on this very issue, which we discussed at length. The Qatari government is taking a lead and working intensely to help release hostages using their contacts in the region, and we are working very closely with them to ensure the safe return of the British hostages. Kirsten. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, I also met charities with staff working in Gaza and heard their accounts of the harrowing humanitarian crisis. Children fleeing their homes, hospitals barely able to function. The lights are going out and the innocent civilians of Gaza are terrified that they will die in the darkness, out of sight. International law must always be followed. Hamas are not the Palestinian people and the Palestinian people are not Hamas. Does he agree that medicines, food, fuel and water must get into Gaza immediately? This is an urgent situation and innocent Palestinians need to know that the world is not just simply watching but acting to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. Mr Speaker, as I said on Monday, an acute humanitarian crisis is unfolding to which we must respond. It is right that we support the Palestinian people because they are victims of Hamas yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is why we have provided a further £10 million in humanitarian aid for people in the region. And we are working through preemptively moving aid and relief teams to Egypt, specifically to the El Arish airfield. We are working with local partners like the Egyptian Red Crescent and the United Nations primarily, and deploying Navy assets to the region, as well as exploring how we can support logistical requirements. And I've also raised this issue of humanitarian access in all of my conversations as a priority with every leader in the region 
and we will continue working with them to get aid to where it is needed as quickly as possible. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As has already been alluded to, since Hamas's terrorist attack, our country has seen a disgusting rise in anti-Semitism. Jewish businesses attacked, Jewish schools marked with red paint, and Jewish families hiding who they are. And we've seen an appalling surge in Islamophobia, racist graffiti, mosques forced to ramp up security, British Muslims and Palestinians spoken to as if they were terrorists. Does he agree with me that every member of this House has a duty, a duty, to work in their constituency and across the country to say no to this hate and to ensure every British Jew and every British Muslim knows that they can live their life free from fear and free from discrimination here in their own country? Mr Speaker, all of us in this House can play our part in stamping out those who seek to cause division and hate in our society. Uh, we will make sure that we continue funding, as I said, the Community Security Trust, uh, but also the equivalent Protective Security Grant to protect mosques and other places of worship for the Islamic community in the UK. That funding was increased earlier this year. We will also remain in dialogue with the police to make sure that they are aware of the full tools at their disposal to arrest those who perpetrate hate crimes, incite racial or other religious violence. There is no place for that in our society, and I know this House will stand united in making sure that those who do this face the full force of the law. Yes, Thank you, Mr Speaker. We do not want this conflict to harm us here at home, and we do not want it to escalate in the Middle East, where there has been too much bloodshed, too much darkness for too long. A two-state solution a Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel feels more distant than ever, but it remains the only way through. Does the Prime Minister agree that because hope is at its thinnest, we must work our hardest to ensure the voices of division and despair are sidelined and that, however difficult it seems, the hope of a political path to peace is maintained? Mr Speaker, it is precisely because it is that vision of a more hopeful, peaceful future that Hamas tried to destroy that we must redouble our efforts to try and bring that future about. And all our conversations that both myself and the Foreign Secretary have had with regional leaders, we've emphasised our commitment to making sure that we make progress on all the avenues that will lead towards that peaceful future, uh, and that has been a feature of both mine and the Foreign Secretary's dialogue, and I'm confident that there is willingness in the region not to escalate this crisis beyond dealing with Hamas, the terrorist organisation, but also to strive very hard to a future where Palestinians and Israelis can coexist peacefully, side by side, and look forward to a future filled with dignity, security and prosperity. This is a crisis where lives hang in the balance and where the enemies of peace and democracy would like nothing more than for us to become divided and to abandon our values. Does the Prime Minister agree that during this grave crisis, this House must strive to speak with one voice in condemnation of terror, in support of Israel's right to self-defence and for the dignity of all human life? that cannot be protected without humanitarian access to those suffering in Gaza and the constant maintenance of the rule of international law. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I agree. We will in this House speak with one voice in condemning Hamas for perpetrating a shockingly brutal terrorist attack and causing untold suffering on many. And as the Honourable Gentleman said, we stand united in supporting Israel's right to defend itself, to protect its people and to act against terrorism. Unlike Hamas, the Israeli president has made it very clear that their armed forces will operate in accordance with international law and we will continue to urge the Israelis to take every precaution to avoid harming civilians, whilst remembering, importantly in this House, that it is Hamas that is cruelly embedding itself in civilian populations. 
So uh, that was the very sombre return then to Parliament of the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, the opposition leader, uh, Keir Starmer. Um, I thought that the tone of that was uh, extremely serious and sombre. Um, There was also, uh, I thought, very interestingly at play, Keir Starmer, you know, trying to show all of the leadership qualities that I think he wants to embody. You know, the politics is is, is never that far away. Keir Starmer, obviously, as a former prosecutor, was talking very strongly and from experience on the idea of uh, Israel sticking to international law when it comes to the conflict uh, with Hamas. Keir Starmer talking about having met the families of the hostages that Hamas has and then the Prime Minister uh, speaking about how he has raised at every uh, discussion with leaders in the region humanitarian aid for, for Palestinian people, separating out uh, you know, Hamas and not being the Palestinian people, the Palestinian people not being Hamas. Yeah, both sides really trying to show that that they could rise above the politics, even though we've just had party conferences. They could have gone for such a different tone here, but really trying to show that they're on the same page here. There was a very, very, very subtle sense of one-upmanship of who could be the most prime ministerial. Uh, you know, Sunak, as you say, talking about his diplomatic efforts internationally. Starmer also talking about who he's met. Uh, Sunak making the point that the distinction between Hamas and and mm. the Palestinian people, uh, Sunak really underscoring the distinction, uh, saying that Hamas and Hamas alone is responsible, and then Starmer repeating that distinction explicitly. Starmer mm. also asking about anti-Semitism and the domestic ramifications potentially, uh, also anti-Muslim discrimination, and then Starmer talking about the need to be united and Sunak agreeing. Uh, but as you say, a very sombre mo- mood in the House of Commons. Yeah, I also would pick out this line from Keir Starmer talking about um, the appalling surge in anti-Semitic attacks in the UK and in Islamophobia, um, and talking about how how every British Jew and every British Muslim should be able to be free to live in their own country. I thought that really did hit the mood, um, you know, and was very explicit in terms of um, in terms of Starmer's view of the situation. Uh, look, I think a very difficult time ahead of what may well be Rishi Sunak's visit to the region. Yeah, and a call to action for every MP in the House Mm. to try and make sure that that discrimination doesn't flare up in response to these attacks. Yeah. Well, look, the war in Israel um, against Hamas has also meant that we have not talked um, as much about, you mentioned, party conference. We're coming to the end of that now. And in fact, it was Britain's third largest political movement that went last. This is the SNP. Now, Hamza Yusuf, the party leader since March, gave his first party conference speech in the last few days talking about planning to freeze council's tax in Scotland. Yusuf, the Scottish First Minister, though, has also become more prominent across the UK in recent days because the parents of his wife, Nadia El Nakla, have become trapped in Gaza. Yusuf's mother-in-law and her husband were visiting relatives in the region when the fighting actually began. Uh, So that sort of propelling um, him into, you know, uh, into the UK um, much, uh, much more, in fact. Uh, And this comes at a very important time for the SNP politically. Remember, they lost pretty spectacularly only in the last few weeks to Labour in a by-election. Yeah, so it really adds to the party's woes because you'll remember uh, Yusuf's popular predecessor, Nicola Sturgeon, was arrested before being let go without charge earlier this year as the police investigate the SNP's finances. And he admits that that whole affair hangs over the party. The longer the police investigation goes on, then the more difficult, undoubtedly, it's going to be for the party. I respect the police has to take whatever time it feels necessary. What I've got to focus on is what what am I in control of? And I am in control of making sure the Scottish Government delivers. And so using that control, he has sought to frame the next election as being around the cost of living. We know that people are filled with dread when bills are going up and up. Now, we can't stop all bells from rising. But where we can act, we absolutely should. 
So Hamza Yusuf there uh, talking about the cost of living crisis. We know that this is going to be the ground um, uh, on which the next general election is going to be fought, the battle for for votes. And speaking of that cost of living issue, UK inflation disappointingly came in slightly higher than expected, Lizzie, this morning. We were talking about it when the figures emerged at 7am. Yeah, holding steady at the headline level and higher than expectations, headline core and services levels. Uh, actually a tick up from from last month on mm. services, so we're moving the wrong direction there. We're joined in the studio, I'm pleased to say, by our UK economy reporter, Lucy White, for analysis of the political ramifications. Lucy, great to have you with us. Thank you. I wonder how the government's reacted to these figures, because of course, they're not exactly what they'd been hoping for. Exactly. Well, if you listen to Andrew Griffith on his media rounds this morning, he said the 6.7% inflation reading steady on the previous month was actually not disappointing and um, was not a surprise to him. Um, he said there was still more to do to get inflation back down. Obviously, we've got the government trying to halve inflation by the end of this year from the end of last year. And eventually that needs to become you know, down to the 2% target that the Bank of England has to aim for. Um, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor this morning, saying that inflation rarely goes down in a straight line, but that we need to stick to the plan. Obviously, that plan is mostly in the Bank of England's hands and they've got their next meeting on November the 2nd. Yeah, absolutely. The plan is, you know, interest rates remaining half for longer. How does this compare internationally then? I mean, I'm always quite interested in how the UK is, is doing comparatively. On inflation, it is particularly high, um, something of an outlier. The Eurozone has inflation currently around 5%. In the US, it's just under 4%. We've had, of course, those energy problems that have also been seen in the EU. Um, and we've got that kind of mixed with the labour problems that were seen more in the US as well. Uh, both of those problems are now starting to ease. We saw labour market data earlier this week showing some signs of cooling in the labour market. Um, you know, payroll numbers of people on payrolls were ticking down. Uh, average weekly earnings growth was slowing, although it is still at record near record highs. Um, but we are kind of still, you know, tied in between those those two problems. <clears throat> the other uh, implication of all this, though, Lucy, is for the welfare payments, because they're based on the September reading of CPI. Um, when we have had Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor at party conference, giving this get on your bike message uh, to try and reduce economic inactivity in the UK, does it mean that this up rating is set in stone or not? It's interesting you should ask that because we have heard some rumours, as some of my colleagues have reported, that Jeremy Hunt could look to curb the benefits up rating. Um, so that would give him more room to announce tax cuts next spring in his budget, which is obviously ahead of a presumed general election coming next year. Would look good for him, would look good for the for the Tory votership. Um, but also we, we've got the triple lock as well, obviously. So, you know, that, that pensions are... Um, are you know uprated in line with either wages, inflation, or the arbitrary number that, that that's given, um, and at the moment there is all, there is also the the possibility that Jeremy Hunt could use the X bonuses wages figure, which is going to be higher than inflation at the moment, to um, to to set that uprating. So there are various ways at which he's looking to kind of glean some. Uh, space back, I suppose, ahead of the spring budget. So it is perfectly possible that he may be looking to to curb wages um, as well. I think it would mean if we do see inflation fall back quite dramatically next year, it could mean that wages up, uh, sorry, benefits up ratings mm. are still, you know, relatively generous when you look at where inflation is next year. Yeah, although that is still a difficult message, isn't it? And there was a huge amount of fury as energy costs and food costs started to spiral, started to escalate so rapidly in the UK that actually the people left behind were people on benefits and it took months before they then got an uplift. So rolling sure. that back uh, is is controversial. Look, where does this leave the Bank of England? Um, you know, I wonder if you're a mortgage holder out there, you'll be perhaps, or, you know, first time bar thinking about that for November. So, uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, we're seeing the Bank of England announce the uh, results of its latest monetary policy meeting on November the 2nd. The data has been kind of inconclusive, to be honest. You know, as we said, we had the labour market data earlier this week or part of the labour market data. We've got more next Tuesday that showed some cooling, but, you know, still wage growth near historic highs. We've had a lot of speeches from various members of the Monetary Policy Committee in recent days. We've got um, Catherine Mann, one of the most hawkish members, 
um, still talking about her worries that um, inflation is becoming embedded in the economy and you know that the wage growth is still too high. We've got Swati Dingra at the other end saying, you know, she's worried about damage to supply capacity from over tightening and the worries that that could lead to stagflation. Mm. And then we've got Hugh Pill, who's the bank's chief economist, who's sort of something on the fence. He's he's worried about those those high weight that high wage growth, but he's also worried about the the risk of over tightening. Mm. And we've got this debate on the on the panel as well as to how much of the fourteen rate hikes have currently passed through. Yeah. So you know, Swati Dingra is talking more about twenty five percent. Hugh Pill's saying more like fifty percent. Yeah. All right, Lucy White, our UK economy reporter, looking ahead to that Bank of England decision on November the 2nd. Going to be a bit trickier after this morning's numbers. Thank you for being with us. That's it from us for today. If you like the programme, don't forget to subscribe and give it five stars so other people can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen. This episode was produced by James Walcock. Our audio engineer was Marufal Hussain. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Lizzie Burden. We'll be back with more tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg UK Politics. Listen weekdays at noon on DAB Digital Radio in London.